the summer of the year 628, Chinese monk Xuanzang is in Central Asia. He survived the treacherous and snow-filled passes of the Tian Shan Mountains to reach Suyab, the first city he will visit in Central Asia. It's now a year since he left the Tang Empire. The Western Turkic Khaganate dominates Central Asia. Its Khan receives Xuanzang at his yurt in Suyab. The nomadic people dwell in simple yurts, but the Khan's is luxurious, and its opulence surprises Xuanzang. The Khan lived inside a huge yurt. It was decorated with gold floral patterns and was splendid and dazzling. <laughs> As the Tang Empire rises in the east, he builds the Turkic Khaganate in the west. To ensure their common rivalry doesn't flare into conflict, the Khaganate tries to maintain good relations with the Tang Dynasty. Xuanzang <laughs> notices that the Chinese envoy is at the reception banquet. sworn brother of the king of Gaocheng with a letter of introduction and tributes for the Khan, Xuanzang is warmly received. selects a military officer who had been to Chang'an and is proficient in several languages to escort Xuanzang. Summer is coming to the steppes of Central Asia. Xuanzang and his followers set off from Suyab to resume the pilgrimage. After leaving Suyab, we soon arrived at Jianchuan. With a radius of over 100 kilometers, this place has abundant water resources. The land is fertile. There are many lakes, and the can comes here every summer. Xuanzang and his group now face the long trek across the steppes of Central Asia. Near today's Jambul region in Kazakhstan, Xuanzang comes to a small town inhabited by Chinese people. We went west from Chanchuan and arrived at Xiaoguchang. Over 300 households from all over China were here. They were forced to come here by the Turkic people and lived here together thereafter. Although dressed in the Turkish way, they spoke Chinese and maintained the customs. With a radius of over 500 kilometers, Jusha Kingdom had dozens of cities, separately ruled by kings and headmen, but all were vassals of the Turkic Khaganate. Jusha Kingdom was located near modern-day Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan. In Chinese history, this kingdom is also known as Shu Kingdom. The ancestors of many Chinese people with the family name of Shu lived here. In the desert, we could hardly see the way with all the sand in the air and could only stare at the mountain trying to take our bearings. After walking for 250 kilometers, we arrived at the kingdom of Samarkand. After an arduous journey, 
Xuanzang finally reaches the most legendary city of Central Asia, Samarkand. It's one of the most ancient cities in the world. Civilization first appears here in the 7th century BC. Exotic treasures had been gathered from around this kingdom, and there were craft works which were top notch among other kingdoms. Xuanzang considers the craftsmanship in Samarkand to be the best of all the kingdoms. The Sogdian people live in Samarkand and not only produce refined products, but also control trade along the Silk Road. They're born merchants, keen on seeking their fortune with an adventurous spirit. Between Chang'an in the east and Rome in the west, they carry on trade day in and day out. A thousand years later, this tradition survives. Exotic kingdoms all took Samarkand as an example, imitating its customs as well as systems and regulations. Its king was brave and bold, and his orders were observed by the neighboring kingdoms. The warriors were strong and staunch, and not in the least afraid of death. However, Samarkand does not welcome the arrival of Xuanzang. His two disciples are even attacked by the locals. In the early 7th century, the people here believe in Mazdaism rather than Buddhism. The king and his subjects did not believe in Buddhism. They were all followers of Mazdaism. There were two temples, but with no monks. The local museum displays relics of that era. To the followers of Mazdaism, Buddhism is heresy and must be suppressed. When Xuanzang's two disciples are seen praying at an abandoned temple, the local people chase and attack them. Even though the king of Samarkand is a follower of Mazdaism, Xuanzang discusses Buddhism with him. As a monk, Xuanzang is simply following his destiny. His eloquence moves the king and convinces him to embrace Buddhism. The king was very pleased after hearing the texts of Buddhism and no longer gave us the cold shoulder. Xuanzang convinces the king of Samarkand to accept Buddhism in just one night. From that moment on, people in this kingdom no longer attacked monks and the temples were attended by worshipers. Monks also began to live in them. Religious intolerance comes to an end as Buddhism is once again welcome in Samarkand. In the history of Samarkand, this may be seen as an important cultural transformation. Renowned as the crown jewel of Central Asia, the city is closely linked with the Chinese people. In ancient China, Samarkand is known as the Kingdom of Kang. The forefathers of many Chinese people with the family name Kang originate here. In the ruined 
ruins of the Samarkand Palace, archaeologists find large wall paintings with depictions of envoys from the Tang Empire. They wear officers' caps, have long knives on their waists, and carry silk in their hands. Royal ladies, accompanied by musicians, drift by on a boat. The paintings are from the 7th century, the time of Xuanzang. It's quite unexpected to discover that in faraway Samarkand, the customs of the Tang dynasty are popular. That Xuanzang is able to change the king of Samarkand's opposition to Buddhism in one night is the result of the unique charm of Chinese culture. In the royal palace of Samarkand, Xuanzang becomes a cultural ambassador. His knowledge, extraordinary personality, and eloquence allow Xuanzang to make a deep impression on the people of this exotic land. In later centuries, great changes will come to Central Asia. Islam will become the dominant religion. The armies of Genghis Khan will conquer Samarkand and destroy the city and Tamerlane will build a great nomadic empire in Central Asia, with Samarkand as its center. This is the site of the imposing institute, the towering mosque, and the invaluable tomb of Tamerlane. In today's Samarkand, Traces of the Timurid Empire are still seen everywhere. However, the Samarkand Xuanzang visits in the 7th century is now gone. After leaving Samarkand, Xuanzang reaches the small state of Kusana. The location of Kusana is in today's Shah Rasab in Uzbekistan. This is the hometown of Tamerlane. He was born here. Archaeologists say there are the remains of a Chinese town here. During their excavations, they uncover many cultural items in this area. The abandoned settlement is now only marked by a large mound. Many families with the surname of Shu originate in Kusana. We entered the mountain after walking for 100 kilometers. The path was sunken and hard to traverse. There were no weeds on it anywhere. After leaving Kusana, Xuanzang reaches the most famous pass in Central Asia, Iron Gate. We reached Iron Gate Pass after walking 150 kilometers through mountains. The place was full of steep cliffs and iron mines. The gate was set against the mountain, and it was made of iron. On its surface, there were many iron bells. Iron Gate Pass connects Central Asia and South Asia. In the year 628, this military fortress is controlled by the Turkic people. Being the friend of the Khan and accompanied by Turkic soldiers, Xuanzang easily gets through. The gorge rings with the sound of iron bells as he begins the journey south. The 
next stop for Xuanzang is the Kingdom of Dami. The place had Iron Gate Pass to its north, snow-covered mountains to the south, the Pamir Plateau to the east, and Persia to the west. Across the center flowed a vast river. South of Iron Gate Pass is the boundary between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. The Amu Darya is the largest river in Central Asia. On the right bank of the river is a city in the southernmost part of Uzbekistan, Termez, the kingdom of Dami in the time of Xuanzang. Buddhism flourishes here in the 7th century. This is the site of the Fuyaz Tepa Buddhist Monastery, located very close to the Amu Darya River. The monastery is rectangular. Its design allows it to house monks' rooms, a Buddhist prayer hall, and a kitchen. Traces of a cooking range remain in the kitchen. In addition to the monks, the monastery also supplies meals for worshippers and travelers. In the 1930s, archaeologists find a statue of Buddha in this monastery. His smile is peaceful and serene. It is easy to imagine Xuanzang praying in front of this statue. India is drawing nearer, and the birthplace of Buddha beckons. Nearby is the site of a larger Buddhist monastery, Karatepa. preserved monastery ruins in Central Asia. Walking through them, visitors can easily imagine the glory days. The region around Termez is also known by its older name of Bactria. In the year 128 BC, more than eight centuries before Xuanzang's arrival, Zhang Chan is the first Chinese official to visit. An ethnic group called the Roja once lived in China's Hoshi Corridor. They had to relocate to Bactria under pressure from the Huns. During the reign of Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty, in order to build an alliance with the Roja against the Huns, Zhang Chan began a diplomatic journey to the West. He was caught by the Huns and held for 10 years before escaping and finding the Roja living by the Amu Darya. The route he followed became a famous passage connecting east and west. This is how the Silk Road came into being. As Xuanzang enters this monastery by the Amu Darya, he not only envisions the glory of Buddha, but also the solitude and resolute image of Zhang Chan. The Ruja people reject going back to the east and have no intention of fighting with the Han Empire against the Huns. They found a new homeland. As the Han Empire waged war against the Huns in the east, the Roja people founded the Kushan Empire in the west. It will endure for three centuries. Buddha was venerated in this empire and widely promoted along the Amu Darya. Inside a monk's cell in the Karatepa Buddhist Monastery, 
the recesses in the wall can still be seen. The candles illuminate Buddhist scriptures for the monks to study. In the spacious hall, with the smoke from incense drifting through the air, believers would listen to the teaching of eminent monks. The pagoda and Buddha statue here were said to have healing properties. Divine light could often be seen. For travelers, the monastery was a lodge offering consolation for the heart and a stopover on the journey of life. It's very likely this is the place in Termez that Xuanzang and his followers take shelter and rest after their long journey. With the protection of the Western Turkic Khaganate, Xuanzang soon crosses the steppes. History records indicate Xuanzang travels from Samarkand to Termez during the summer. His own record says this part of the journey is peaceful, but they encounter hardship. In the wilderness surrounding Tremez, the temperature can rise above 40 degrees Celsius, and it's easy to suffer sunstroke. Xuanzang doesn't stay for long. After getting water and food, he sets out immediately. Near the ancient city of Termez, there is a deserted Buddhist stupa called Zermala Tower. It was said to be built of more than a million clay bricks. They can be clearly seen despite the centuries of erosion. One thousand years ago, it would have seemed to reach into the clouds and point toward heaven. Halfway through the summer of 628, as Xuanzang leaves Termez, he turns for one last look. The towering stupa under the sky watches as he moves off on his journey to India and the pursuit of his dream. After Termez, Xuanzang arrives at the kingdom of Ho, which is also under the control of the Western Turkic Khaganate. But Xuanzang is unaware that a murder is about to take place. Summer of the year 628, Xuanzang crosses the steppes of Central Asia and reaches the Amu Darya River. The monk, his two disciples, and an escort of Turkic soldiers arrive in the kingdom of Hul, in what is now Afghanistan. Xuanzang feels a connection to this kingdom. It's part of the Western Turkic Khaganate and is ruled by Dadu, the eldest son of the Khan. His wife was the younger sister of the King of Gaochang, with whom Xuanzang is a sworn brother. Unfortunately, he arrives too late to meet her. She has just passed away, leaving behind a young son. 
Dadu himself is very sick. Dadu suggested I rest for a few days. He wanted to see me off to India when he was feeling better. Xuanzang cannot imagine the intrigue that's about to happen. The Great Tang records of the Western region say Dadu marries a young woman after he recovers from his illness. This hasty marriage turns out to be a fatal mistake. The woman colludes with one of Dadu's adult sons and poisons the king. The son then claims the throne. throws the small country into great turmoil. Xuanzang is forced to remain for about a month. According to history records, after entering the territory of what is now Afghanistan, the progress of Xuanzang's journey to the west slows. The snowy mountains were quite dangerous, with lofty jagged peaks one after another. The constant snowstorms made it even more difficult to pass through. Robbers, evil spirits, and monsters looted and killed at will. This is the second time Xuanzang is forced to make a difficult trek through snow-covered mountains he must find his way across the treacherous Hindu Kush mountains where he encounters a blizzard. I lost my sense of direction in the storms. Fortunately, a hunter led me through the mountains. I finally arrived in Kapizi. He enters the kingdom of Kapisi, located close to what is now the city of Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. The Great Tang records of the western regions mention a large temple in Kapisi. The local monks say it's the former home of a Chinese prince. Xuanzang is touched upon hearing about someone from his home country. It takes him about six months to travel across the country. Beginning in the first century, the Kushan Empire takes control of the regions along the Kabul River. Buddhism is widely worshipped in the empire. Xuanzang teaches and visits Buddhist sites and relics during his time here. In Jalalabad on the south bank of the Kabul River, Xuanzang is shown a precious relic of Buddha. There was a multi-story building in the city. On the second floor, there was a small pagoda. The milky parietal bone was placed in a casket in the pagoda. Xuanzang also goes to see a cave in the mountains near Jalalabad. It's said that people can see Buddha's image there. But because of its remoteness and harassment by robbers, few people dare to go. But Xuanzang comes with two disciples to see Buddha's image for himself. leave 
life without seeing the Buddha. The biography of Xuanzang says no image appears after he prays 100 times. Then he prays another 100 times and it appears but vanishes in the blink of an eye. After he prays another 200 times, the image of Buddha wearing a yellow cassock appears quite distinctly. In the secular world, Xuanzang appears calm and pragmatic. He seldom discloses his feelings. But upon seeing the image of Buddha, it's said he becomes overcome with wonder as if he's a child. It's difficult for people to believe that an image actually appears before him. It could simply be an illusion caused by natural conditions. But to Xuanzang, the event is real and stunning. In the autumn of 628, a year after leaving Chang'an, he finally reaches the holy land which has a hold on his heart. It's the drought season when he arrives at the Indus River but it's still an impressive sight. As he enters India, he's accompanied only by his two disciples. The region is not controlled by the Western Turkic Khaganate, and the soldiers of the Khan turn and return home. Shortly after he crosses the Indus River, Xuanzang arrives at the famous kingdom of Gandhara. The place is a Buddhist holy land, but he begins to feel a deep sadness as he realizes the religion is now in decline in this kingdom. Gandhara is the gateway to the northern region of the South Asian subcontinent. For centuries, it's an intersection for Greek, Roman, Persian, and steppe cultures. Archaeologists confirm that the ruins of Taxila are located in the center of the former kingdom of Gandhara. In the 6th century BC, Taxila has roads drainage ditches, houses, and shops. It's one of the earliest cities in Southern Asia. The kingdom of Gandhara is deeply influenced by Greek culture by Alexander the Great's eastward expedition in the fourth century BC. A century later, ancient India introduces Buddhism. But it's the Roji people from China who bring prosperity to Gandhara. They not only establish the Kushan Empire, they also create immortal works of Buddhist art. In the early years of Buddhism, art is considered idolatry monks commemorate the Buddha only with his footprints and the banyan. The first statue appears about 500 years after Buddhism is established. Scholars believe it's likely created in Gandhara, the center of the Kushan Empire. 
The Taxila Museum has many Buddhist statues from that early period. The image of Buddha was quite similar to Apollo, the god of light, with a prominent nose, deep eyes, curly hair, and a Greek-style robe. Alexander the Great's expedition carries Greek culture to Gandhara. The Greek influence can be seen in one of the earliest statues of Buddha created by the people of Kushan. second century, Emperor Kanishka of India helps the Kushan Empire achieve great prosperity. He believes in Buddhism and spreads it with Gandhara as the center. During this period, Zhang Chan, the envoy from the Han Empire, arrives in the western regions. The Silk Road creates a link between East and West, and Buddhism goes to China. Greek and Indian cultures blend in the art of Gandhara. The style is unique and becomes a magnificent chapter in civilization. Chinese Buddhist art originates in Gandhara. The people of Kushan not only make the earliest Buddha statues, but also bring Buddhism to its peak. Gandhara becomes the center of Buddhism in ancient India. In the fifth century, invaders from the Eurasian steppes conquer Gandhara. These nomadic people do not believe in Buddhism and lay waste to the city. Many temples are burned, and the monks are cast out. The Great Tong records of the western regions contains a description of the many holy sites in Gandhara. There was a great banyan tree about four kilometers southeast of the city. Buddha once sat under the tree, facing the south. There was a pagoda to the south of the tree. It was built by Emperor Kanishka. The Buddha statue was made of white stone and sat to the southwest of the pagoda from where it radiated its glory. More than a millennia later, these holy relics are now gone. Nobody knows the exact spot where they stood. Leaving Gandhara, Xuanzang heads to the southeast and enters what is today known as the Kashmir region. According to Xuanzang's record, India was divided into more than 70 kingdoms at that time. Kashmir was one of them. The history records say he stayed in Kashmir for about two years. The people here were good looking but cunning. They were curious and knowledgeable. They believed in Buddhism and other religions. There were about 5,000 monks and 100 temples here. to Buddhism, people in ancient India also believe in Brahmanism and Jainism. In Kashmir, Buddhism becomes popular quickly. This is the place where all Buddhist scriptures will be collected together for the fourth time in the history of the religion. To collect Buddhist scriptures means to chant them to an assembly to verify authenticity. At that time, it's difficult to write all the scriptures down. Most of the classic Buddhist scriptures are passed orally from one generation to the next. 
In order to ensure all scriptures remain accurate, eminent monks in the ancient world gathered together from time to time to chant the scriptures. If monks hear mistakes in the scriptures, they correct them according to the opinion of the majority. In the first century, Emperor Kanishka, third ruler of the Kushan Empire, gathers 500 eminent monks in Kashmir for the fourth chorus. The great Tang records of the Western regions contains a reference to the achievements of the chorus. There were 300,000 Buddhist scriptures. Monks carefully examined every word of them. They discussed the meaning behind the wording. The scriptures were authoritative documents to later generations. The integrated classic Buddhist scriptures are kept in Kashmira. They're the most valuable treasures Xuanzang had ever dreamed of encountering. He left the Tang Empire for India because of confusion regarding the truth of Buddhism. He studies the scriptures so thoroughly that he doesn't notice that a whole year passes in Kashmira. In August of 629, he leaves Kashmir and goes south after reading all the Buddhist scriptures. His final destination is Nalanda, the place he believes is the center of Buddhist culture. Xuanzang is getting closer to his final destination. In the ancient forest of India's Punjab, he and his disciples encounter dozens of robbers. He records this misfortune in his biography. About 50 robbers tried to kill us in an abandoned pond. Fortunately, my disciples found a secret water-filled tunnel and we managed to escape. As he is traveling in northern India, a major event takes place in the Tang Empire. Three years after he leaves Chang'an, the Emperor Taizong of the Tang Empire begins a war against the Eastern Turkic Khaganate. In 630, the Khan is captured and hundreds of thousands of Turkic people surrender. The northwestern border of the Tang Empire enters a period of peace. In this same year, Xuanzang travels more than 1,500 kilometers, crossing seven kingdoms in northern India. In the Tang Dynasty capital of Chang'an, nomadic folk, including the Turkic people, call the Emperor Taizong the Great Khan of Heaven. History records say that Taizong performs an impromptu dance at a gala to mark the victory. His father thoroughly enjoys the lute performance. Members of the Chinese royal family had never behaved like this in public before. The people now witness the great confidence of their emperor. The Tang dynasty is now truly powerful. Xuanzang at this time is visiting a small kingdom named Tsinabutki. According to him, this means Chinese land. During the Han Dynasty, a Chinese prince lived here. The people here were very respectful towards China. They always pointed at me saying, this person is from the same country as our previous rulers. The people of this tiny place appreciate Xuanzang as much as they love China. He stays for nearly six months. When travelers spend a long time away from their countries, the reputation and image of their homeland means a lot. 
Xuanzang had left the Tang Empire three years earlier, when the security of the country was worrisome. But now it's becoming a great nation. The increasingly influential Tang Empire has a significant influence on his journey. In the spring of 631, he reaches the Ganges River, four years after leaving Chang'an. The water was clean and the waves were tumbling. The fine sands drifted along with the water. Xuanzang's description is similar in many ways to how the river looks today. Hindus believe the Ganges is a holy river. Hinduism spread several centuries before Buddhism. It's one of the oldest faiths in the world. Today, many people in India still believe in the magic of the Ganges, just like their ancestors. To Hindus, the Ganges is holy. It can cleanse people's sins. Believers will not enter hell if their bodies are immersed in the river after they die. Its water is said to release their souls from purgatory. It's here, though, that Xuanzang encounters a most difficult time in his pilgrimage. 